Uh, he obviously got on uh, like a house on fire with the managing director there, who was Michael Punch. And along with Joe Murphy and Michael Punch, they went on to form Michael Punch and Partners, who have been responsible for some of the uh, amazing structures that exist in Limerick and throughout the country. Um, so uh, Michael Punch and Partners have now been rebranded as Punch Consulting and Kevin X as a consultant to Punch Consulting. Uh, if I was to take you through all of the projects Kevin has worked on, you'd have no time to listen to Kevin. But just of, of note, uh, he was or is involved in the Opera project, so he's very familiar with what you've just been discussing here. He's also involved with uh, the rugby experience under construction on O'Connell Street. And I guess he has developed his own niche in the area of conservation. Uh, currently he's working on Dangan Castle in County Meath, uh, famous as being the birthplace of the Duke of Wellington, for whom we can thank for having our Wellingtons and our beef Wellingtons. Um, and uh, uh, has worked also in the UK in Nissan Car Factory uh, development and uh, in some nuclear power facilities. Uh, and very much by his own admission, he's still in the game. So, Kevin, over well, to you. Thank you very much. You're very kind. Of So, by the way, this is known as the graveyard shift. So, if you doze off or find your head nodding or anything, don't worry about that. I won't take anything like that personal. Uh, probably mostly thinking about how you got to chill this evening. And I wouldn't be surprised. You've put on an amazing uh, presentation here today. You know, and I think back to I would have been in this equivalent class in about 1970 nowhere near this level of accomplishment for training. You know, I take my hats off to you. The courage to stand before the crowd, put your ideas out there, something. Anyway, I'll move on. I'll try not to delay you. Uh, that was the team, Kevin Mullery, Ger Neville, and myself. Uh, Clint Mills burned down in 2000, Christmas Day, 2009. That's one of the images from it. That's what it looked like inside. <coughs> that was pretty much what it looks like today. Uh, so I think it's all that. Then we let the pictures do the talk. And that was the client project management team, the design team there. Builders were put together, two local builders, uh, uh, Purcells and Jim. And they did an amazing job. That was Richard Hurley framed the purpose and the aim uh, of what we were there. So that's kind of the general story of Mel's. You know, going back to 1838, remember it was a famine project. Um, one of the major projects, or certainly one of the major Roman Catholic projects in the country at the time it was done. And we went from the ruin to Christmas Day Mass being celebrated in 2014. That was a five year program. That's just the historic stuff. I leave this stuff to Declan so that if you're interested in knowing who did what and who the builders were and everything else like that, you can have access to that. I don't think it's uh, some images of the fire uh, were spotted at whatever time it was spotted. It was that really hard winter, you know, so. Um, but uh, for Christmas Eve Mass, the order was given to, you know, to blast on the 
heating and everything else like that. And whether it was through a flu or something like that, but a fire broke out. Um, it was just, so that's just stuff about the fire, you know, the chimney was fitted with inspection hatches. And it's thought that the burning embers escaped from one of those hatches and set everything off. Uh, more images of what the fire looked like. It, it, I think the temperatures reached something like uh, 1300 degrees in the fire. The, the firefighters had great difficulties. The firemen were frozen. The, the, the hoses were freezing nearly while they were trying to pump water out of it. So that's what, if you like, the, the ruin looked like. The Campanile, the, the, bell, the bell free bell tower, whatever you call it, is, was pretty much unharmed. And the front facade and portico area was pretty much undamaged as well. Extent of damage around the building at windows, stone, etc. Uh, roof gone, the aisles gone, the crypt floor, you know, the whole thing really a giant mess. So. Some unusual things, sorry, some, some unusual survivals. How a painting, an oil painting like that, could survive undamaged, or pretty much undamaged, was remarkable. Okay. Uh, what that shows you is the state of the columns. Uh, and, and, and a conservation engineering task of dealing with that and, and, and maintaining in place <coughs> the upper levels. What we discovered about the, uh, the columns and how they failed was, as you probably know, limestone, sedimentary limestone is, is actually laid down in layers, horizontal layers, okay? But for some reason, probably due to an arc, we're guessing at this, the, the, the drums that you can see there in the columns are about two, two and a half meters. They're not very easily got from limestone bedding, okay? Because you don't get that kind of depth without faults. So they made the decision to, to roll the columns, the drums, if you like, from horizontal sections. So the limestone, instead of being horizontally laid in, in, in very powerful in compression, was laid bed vertical or harvested bed vertical. So when it got heat, and water, it just delaminated. You know, a lot of heat, a lot of cold water from the hoses. You could make a case, or you could surmise, that it might not, had they been bed vertical, bed, bed horizontal, you mightn't have had that amount of damage. But essentially all the columns were uh, wrecked completely useless. How it continued to stand, you'll see some later images of it. So what could we conserve? The capital stones, the columns were wrecked, gone. There you describe a, a put log stone, could we conserve that? Could, how, how, how many capitals could we conserve? The put log stone that's pointed there is, uh, there might be a picture of it in a minute. We've come to it, I'll talk more about it. So, design, criteria were conservation, maintaining the heritage, and budget and program. We see over here on the right hand side, yeah, there, those are temporary works put in to support the building. 
and there was a temporary roof put on to, 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 to if you like, mitigate the damage that more weather, more rain, and anything else like that. So this is an effort to hold on to what we've got. Uh, temporary supports. This was the column replacement plan. Uh, we took an approach, you see that little yellow column there? We, we took one as just a, a, a trial column to test all our procedures, to test the way we were, the methodology for replacing a column. And then, if you like to apply that methodology and what we learned from it to all the other blue guys. So that's just in text why the column fails. I've already told you that, so there's no need to read the text. Some of the things we did for health and safety reasons was wrapping the columns in that, that blue netting and putting truck straps on them. Sorry, I'll just go back to that. That went very fast. Yeah. There. Okay. So that was literally to stop little bits falling off and hurting people. That's the part, what it looked like when we were done. Okay. So that's just to stop them from crumbling. At this stage, the, 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 the steel structures is supporting everything. So we're not relying anymore on the columns. You just don't want them to fall apart on their own. That's what the, the temporary structures look like. You know, steel frame, uh, come up, prop the arches, hold everything together. I mentioned the put log stone earlier on. That's what the put log stone actually looked like. So you could, it, it's, it's really a lovely piece of engineering because, uh, I want to press this, but here. Those are the springing points for the arches on each side, they spring from there. But then for the, uh, for the construction, the false work and the insertion of trusses and all of that, that becomes, uh, if you like, it's an ingenious piece of design to allow temporary works, temporary false work and everything else like that to be inserted and held during the construction. It was, it was considered, we considered it really important to keep them and not lose them. So. For the one column we took out, we had to break one putlock stone. But we worked very hard afterwards, so it was the only one. We had to break it so we knew how it worked. But after that, we designed a system up here, with little angles and uh, reversible screw anchors, so that the putlock stones could be held in position. So that when the new columns came in, they would be there. There you can actually just see the top of one of a new column being, lay, being, being, being located under it. Okay? That gap there is about, oh, I don't know, it's only a couple of inches. Uh, this is uh, taking down a column, just wrapping it, cradling it hoisting it and dropping it. Uh, risky work. Risky work. So, this is, gives you an idea of what the original columns look like. Uh, 
Okay, that's an interface between two drums. You can see even, let me see, there. They were, they were metal stitches, probably to, to, uh, to counteract some natural flaw in the stone or natural uh, uh, fault line. So each one originally was laid one on top of another. There was a lead gasket on it, so that you didn't get any severe interface stress between, uh, between each limestone drum. Uh, just to say something on the side about that. When, when, we're, when we're making lime, uh, lime bedding for those, if the if the aggregate in the line is wrong, or too large, or too sharp, one tiny piece of aggregate that's wrong can split a column because it's applying a sharp edge force to it. There is no bedding on, on, on the columns there or what we built. It's a lead gasket the whole way, one on top of the other. So as you get, as it were, a soft bedding in, and compression between one drum and the other. And when the weight comes on, it's forgiving. You're not going to damage, you're not going to split your columns. This is interesting because uh, I remember at the interview, we had identified from our own research that the, the single issue in the whole project from an engineering point of view was the columns. How are we going to deal with the columns? And somebody at the interview, probably talking, you know, uh, somebody knowledgeable uh, on the other side of the table, said, you know, somebody has said that really we could retain the existing columns because it's, they had some idea that, you know, it was only the outside bits that were damaged. And uh, I suppose it, it, that, that argument was, or that that assertion was only finally put to bed when they saw this. So, there you go. Looks all right, doesn't it? Remove the strapping, and that's what happened. It literally fell apart. So, the, 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 there was quite a bit of research done to get a like-for-like -like match for the limestone. And between one thing and another, the closest match we could get that had sufficient um, available stone was in a place called Old Lachlan in County Carlow. And it had, it had deep enough beds that we, could, we, we didn't repeat what the original builders, architects, engineers did. We could harvest the stone bed horizontal, but at, at, the, at the same drum length that we were matching from before. Uh, this is uh, done in Tauber and County Clare. <laughs> uh, Irish natural stone. That was the test column being carved, cut. Very difficult in limestone, as you will appreciate from your research on the opera side. Limestone is probably the best natural building material for strength. But it's very hard. So carving it to that is some is some uh, accomplishment. 